Hello, I'm Derek Hitchens and I'd like to talk about chaos and systems engineering. First our roving reporter. Hello Derek. I have been out and about asking about chaos, what people think about chaos and how it might affect us in our everyday lives as system designers and as systems engineers. First what do folks think chaos is. There are different ideas about chaos. The dictionary gives us a condition of total disorder or confusion and the state of unformed matter and infinite space supposed to have existed prior to the ordered universe, at least according to some religious cosmological views. Popularly then, chaos describes something completely without order. And there seem to be a multitude of post-apocalyptic war games that have chaos in their scenario or in their title. However, in mathematics, chaos theory describes something quite different. The behaviour of systems with dynamics that are highly sensitive to initial conditions, so that the behaviour of such chaotic systems might appear to be random. The dynamics of such chaotic systems may be predictable, however, and may form characteristic patterns where motion appears to move around so-called strange attractors. This is called deterministic chaos or simply chaos and is observed in natural systems such as the weather. Tomorrow's weather starts from how today's weather ended. There is a continuum or a repeated cycle so weather on successive days is conditioned by what went before. And in practice, tomorrow's weather is quite likely to be similar to today's. And we don't get snow at the equator nor tropical heat waves at the poles. So weather is well bounded too, with any extremes of weather soon giving way to the more usual behaviour. There's also weak chaos or self-organised criticality, in which systems drive themselves to a critical state, fluctuating about some mean, accumulating or building up substance or energy before releasing or avalanching that substance or energy. Weak chaos is evidence in the pattern of earthquakes, stock exchange price movements, distances between cars on a busy road and many many more. It is a truly ubiquitous phenomenon although unlike deterministic chaos it does not readily lend itself to prediction. While determinic District chaos is mathematically exponential, weak chaos by contrast obeys a power law which it has in common with so-called fractals, meaning that the power index is a fraction rather than a whole number, which in turn suggests that chaos, far from being random, may have underlying form and structure. Fractals, for instance, exhibit self-similarity in which the same shape may appear at different scales and orientations in the one subject. So in nature, a fern frond is made up of many miniature fronds of the same shape emerging from the frond's main stem. And in astronomy, we may have solar systems with many circling planets, while some of those planets have many circling moons, and so on. So we have quite different viewpoints. To the man in the street, chaos is total disorder. To the mathematician or scientist, chaos is far from being random, instead it conceals hidden order. To the engineer it appears as a threat to his systematic well-ordered methods, so something to be avoided. I'm not sure that those explanations really help. It seems that the man on the Clapham omnibus and the scientist are as usual comprehensively out of step, which if nothing else is at least reassuringly familiar. Back to you, Derek. Well thank you for that Derek. I'm not sure how much it helps, as you say. And the questions still remain. What has chaos to do with systems thinking, system design, systems engineering and so on? And by implication, how does it impact systems engineering principles, if at all? Let's look in a little more detail. Let's start by looking at deterministic chaos. This first came to light, really, um, in about 1887. A French mathematician by the name of Juan Carré uh, was taking part in a mathematics competition. 
this competition was set up for the King of Sweden uh, to celebrate his 60th birthday. And the question was posed, how do you solve the then famous three body problem? These are three celestial bodies revolving about each other in space. Juan Carey entered the competition and won it, although at the time he and the organisers knew he didn't have a complete solution. His, his solution for the competition is shown in the upper graph, where you can see three bodies revolving around each other and producing a nice regular repeating pattern. However, change the starting conditions and you can get instead the bottom trace of three revolving bodies. And this is because, um, if you notice carefully, you'll see that two of them keep going close to each other. There again, and again, and again, and so on. That pattern never repeats, and that was the first uh, real evidence of deterministic chaos. From this, Poincaré has been um, called the father of chaos, and an apparently simple Newtonian system uh, was found to be able to exhibit really quite complex behaviour. More recently, there's been a rediscovery of chaos attributed to Edward Lorenz. He was using early computers to simulate weather. Let us have a look at the Lorenz model. This is a stellar model and you can see uh, on the graph page there the three uh, simultaneous equations that Lorenz used to represent the weather. If we look at the so-called butterfly diagram here, uh, we can see that these, um, the three characteristics X, Y and Z uh, produced a strange attractor when the uh, simulation was run. What's a strange attractor? A simple attractor is circular or elliptical or might describe the motion of a simple pendulum. A strange attractor appears to have two foci around which motion is attracted. This particular strange attractor represents the pathway that all forms of weather might take. Let's run it and see. And there we have the so-called butterfly. Uh, we can uh, play games with this. And if we start here, for example, we can uh, do a run of one character. In this case, it's X. And we can see that it produces a quite irregular pattern. Let's um, inject a very small change to the starting conditions. As small as we can get. Oh, there we go. And let's see what happens when we run that. It starts off running exactly the same. You can see that the second line superimposes on the first line up until about here and they suddenly diverge and there we go let's let's run a third line and this time let's run it a bit more slowly and this time we put a big difference in are we ready run the green line's coming it's following as before and it diverges so even small errors produce quite different characteristics. That describes what's been going on. The slider is set to inject a single pulse into the flow. If we look at some stored graphs, we can see that um, we have a top row where there was no uh, injection in the starting conditions and a bottom row where there was a slight change to the starting conditions. The shapes, the general shapes of the top and bottom uh, are very similar. The boundaries, the, uh, how, how high and how low the graphs go, very much the same. And the same detailed patterns appear. 
but they never appear in exactly the same place and although it looks like they're going to repeat they never do this is chaos so Edward Lorenz rediscovered chaos chaos can be caused by uh, overtight coupling an example of that is given here this is vi video feedback um, a TV camera is pointed at a screen showing a picture from TV camera strike a light between the uh, the camera and the screen and all of a sudden a dynamic chaotic pattern emerges this is really quite complex uh, and I'd like to say we fully understand how these patterns emerge but that wouldn't be quite true however we can explore some of these aspects uh, in Stellar again let's have another look at the Stellar model Here we have a very simple chaos model. Let's first look at the model. And you can see that it consists of three reservoirs called here System A, System B and System C. And they are coupled uh, by C to A, A to B and B to C. The only unusual feature here is that the degree of coupling can be ramped. They're mutually coupled bidirectionally. The degree of coupling may be altered. Increasing the coupling moves the model towards the edge of chaos. The equation ramps the coupling upward steadily from periodic through chaotic behaviour until the model goes unstable. Let's have a look at a run. Steady, cyclic behaviour, chaos, getting worse and it finally goes unstable. Now we can actually look at that effect not just uh, in the way we have it by embedding it. Here we see a more complicated system. There's an inflow here into a queue, there's a conveyor belt and then a subsystem of some sort and then a collector and an outcome. There is leakage from the conveyor and there's feedback for rework. So a reasonably complicated little system and the subsystem in there when we open it up we see that it has inside it the uh, chaotic ramping system that we've just been looking at. So the question is what effect does this embedded chaos have in the overall system behaviour? Let's try it and see. And we can see that the output, which is blue, has got a slight variation on it, but the outcome, which is the red, is rising steadily, uh, while the subsystem appears to be behaving pretty well nominally throughout. Many real-world systems may exist on the edge of chaos between order and disorder and some people view complexity as occupying this region between order and chaos. It is possible to explore this region in dynamic simulation, but first a quick look at this uh, logistic bifurcation diagram caused by a very simple um, process of iterating the equation uh, x uh, n plus 1 equals a x to the n into 1 minus x, which I hope many of you will recognise as the sigmoid curve or the logistics equation. Uh, and as you iterate you go from left to right in the diagram above starting off with a single repeating and it goes into two solutions and this point goes into four then goes into eight and then breaks down into chaotic behavior and it goes unstable at the right hand edge let's have a look at um, the edge of chaos in another stellar model what's going on the model is very similar to the simple chaos model except that in this case occasional triggers are introduced to stimulate coupling at time 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and finally at 0 0.90. The first three stimuli die away with time and the model retreats from the edge of chaos. Finally the last trigger occurs before the effects of the previous trigger have died away and the model goes unstable. 
This model was built to illustrate the potential for a society ravaged by successive scares over global warming, financial meltdown, flu pandemics, etc. to recover, but also perhaps to go over the edge into anarchy. The model uh, looks to be exact, uh, identical uh, to the previous model. Now let's run it and see what we get. Starts off nice and orderly. And stops. So there's a pulse, goes in at 0.25, causes it to go chaotic, but you can see it's starting to recover. Then another pulse at 0 0.5, and again it starts to recover. Another point pulse at 0 0.75, and again it starts to recover. But the pulse that comes in here occurs too soon for recovery to have fully taken place, and it goes unstable. We are working here at the edge of chaos, the far edge. Let's have a look now at period doubling, an indicator of the onset of chaos. The regularity of a dripping tap has been used uh, in ancient times as the basis for a clock. If, however, you increase the drip rate of an ordinary tap, uh, then the period between the drips doubles. Increase it further, it may double again, this is the period, and increase it further and you go straight into chaos of turbulent flow. But something else is going on. Look closely, there's evident order and pattern, even within impending chaos. In the medical world, there's a phenomenon referred to as electrical alternans, which is the onset of fibrillation, which is heart attack, preceded by heartbeat period doubling, uh, with perhaps up to six months warning that uh, a heart attack may occur. There's a lot of research going on in that area in the US. And then in electronics, oscillators, if one increases the feedback, period doubling occurs before the oscillator too may uh, go into chaos. And you can see the same phenomenon with double pendulums where small perturbations produce a regular period uh, but drive the pendulum and the period doubling occurs and then chaos. Enough on deterministic. Let's have a quick look at weak chaos. This was brought to the uh, attention of people um, by two researchers back in Chen who were investigating a basis for understanding earthquakes. They took a six centimetre plate and dropped grains of sand onto the plate and as they did so a cone formed. Uh, it finally reached a critical height above which as it went higher there was a possibility of uh, avalanches. An avalanche might reduce the height below the critical height and it would then build up again as there were more grains of sand dropped on. And so there developed a critical height above and below which uh, the cone varied uh, as avalanches took off different numbers of grains of sand. You could measure the numbers of grains falling off the plate each time and when you produced a log, uh, log curve showing the frequency of specific avalanche sizes against the number of sand grains in that particular avalanche, you got, to everyone's surprise, a straight line. Um, well before that time, however, Lewis Fry Richardson investigated the number of deaths in war over the period 1820 to 1960. Um, he found uh, that if one looked at the number of deaths in a conflict uh, and the number of frequency, the frequency of wars of that size, and plotted them out uh, in this fashion, then one got a straight line on a log log curve. Now that's rather strange because during that period from 820, 1820 to 1960, they had uh, brought in machine guns, tanks gas during the First World War, uh, even the atomic bomb during the Second World War. Yet despite all that, there was no deviation from the straight line. 
Mm. And this peculiar uh, arrangement of this log log curve uh, relationship uh, applied to tectonic plate movements and earthquake patterns, that's what Back and Chen had been investigating, and was found to relate to stock exchange price movements. 1 over F noise in conductors um, that was found to be uh, chaotic as well. Distance between cars, we've mentioned, asteroid size and frequency, crime statistics, and many, many more. So fractal patterns of, or weak chaos arise widely in nature and in the affairs of man, and they seem to arise where free flow is hampered or constricted. So here's a conceptual model of restricted flow. What we appear to have in this conceptual model is um, some marbles flowing down past some goth balls. Now these are analogues of course. Um, the marbles are cluster uh, uh, above the um, golf balls as they uh, collide with each other and then they uh, eventually squeeze past and release in groups as avalanches. And this, of course, is very similar in many ways to the sand pile model, but there's just several piles going on at once. Um, there are analogous behaviours to this in many real-world situations. Um, you can think about criminals as being the marbles trying to get past policemen standing there uh, blocking them. Um, this, uh, similar arrangements happen at turnstiles and checkouts, in economic systems, in turbulence, in productions, in factories, and many, many more. This is a very common model that can be applied. So the sand pile is a powerful analogy, analogy for many natural and man-made behaviours. For system design, then, it's sensible to test the design for effects of constricted flow, or fractal flow, or weak chaos, or self-organised criticality. Uh, and the test should be on systems' behaviour, effectiveness and outcome. But how can you do this? Constricted flow in design, intraflows, versus linear flow, perhaps. But how to represent this non-linear, irregular, endemic, constricted flow behaviour? And once again we turn to Stella to see if we can come up with something sensible. So here we have um, a simulation of something like the sand pile. We have an inflow, that's the grains of sand coming in, if you like, and here we have a, a cone of a given height and um, the height increases uh, as the uh, grains come in and it decreases when there's an avalanche. Now the probability of an avalanche is given by some random number as shown and the size of the avalanche is given by a Poisson variable as shown. Put the two together and you have each avalanche occurs as the sand pile rises above the mean or critical height. The higher the pile rises the greater the probability of a slippage or avalanche. However, the size of the avalanche, i.e. the number of grains of sand uh, that slip, is another matter. The model assumes that the size of avalanche follows a Poisson distribution, so integer values only, and that the average, or lambda, of the distribution is given by the difference between height and mean height. So as the height of the cone rises above the mean height, the average value lambda increases, but the actual number of grains slipping varies about that average value according to the Poisson distribution. All of which is very complicated, but let's see what we actually get when we run it. Now if you look at that, there does appear to be uh, a representation of uh, the cone height, as we might call it, the sand pile height. And you can see that the slips happen quite suddenly sometimes. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're very large, and they're quite variable. If we do it quickly, we can see that each run is quite different. We have no idea what's going to come next, 
but it all tends to stay around the same set of values. So there is an average cone height. So there we have a way of representing uh, this fractal flow or weakly chaotic flow, the sand part. So can we look for this self-organized criticality and insert it into simulation models to explore different situations? Well, let's have a look at an example of how we might do that. Here's another stellar model. Let's see about the model. The model is suggestive of an assembly or production line with rework and feedback and a number of cross processes, making for difficult analysis. At the heart of the centre line are two critical processes, or sand piles, which can be loaded into a state of self-organised criticality. One of these critical processes is hidden within a containing system. However, it is possible, as this is a model, to replace the critical processes with smooth exponential processes, which would involve manpower to be continuously available uh, and to eradicate peaks and troughs, which should sort out the problem. But does it? Or is this another of those urban myths? Before we run the model, let's look inside here. You can see a sand pile there. And there's another one in there. Okay, so one at a lower level. Now if I run this model, you can see everything's working. There's a free flow, there's feedback. Quite complicated, so let's have a I pause it to have a look at the control panel and see what's happening. Now, what we're measuring here is mean work in progress throughout the system, through time from inflow to outflow of objects being produced or assembled, and we're using the exponential run at this time. So let's carry on with it. see that the workflow from the uh, so-called sand piles, because we're on the exponential side, is very smooth. Through time is increasing, often uh, increased by having too much feedback. Mean work in progress is climbing. There's more and more uh, objects trapped in the system. So let's change over and look at self-organised criticality and see what difference it makes. Immediately the avalanche take off. Um, as you might imagine, the sand pile is climbing and dropping, which would be representing men being put onto the work as it uh, occurs, but not put on when there's not much going on. So an irregular amount of working. Notice, however, the mean work in progress and the through time. The through time is going down significantly, and the mean work in progress is going down too, speaking relatively. So having this somewhat chaotic approach to uh, these critical processes, turning out to be actually advantageous in what we might call business terms. And that, I think, you may find to be counterintuitive. Is there a relationship between deterministic chaos and self-organised criticality? Well, my favourite example on that comes from ancient Egypt, which depended on the annual Nile inundation for good crops. Good inundation gave a good yield, uh, but a too high or a too low inundation gave a poor yield. The inundation was driven by weather to the south, uh, which effectively is by deterministic chaos, as it's the weather. And the population arose during good inundations and poor inundations led to famine and the population fell. Let's have a look at that in a model. And we can see the uh, chaos model, top left, and we can see that uh, there's good inundation, inundations and poor inundations. And we'll see where they come in as the graph unfolds. 
we can also see self-organized criticality, which is the development of the population. And at right, we can see that famine was a real problem in ancient Egypt uh, from this um, stella, which was uh, is to be found in the Louvre. Let's run it. Good inundations, and the population is rising. It rose in practice to about 2 million people in ancient Egypt. And it rose to a point at which they started to um, have problems feeding the population when there were poor inundations. So famine occurs. And then there's some good inundations, more food, population rises, poor inundations, famine, population falls. The population is going up and down uh, with the uh, poor inundations and the good inundations. So the population is in a state of self-organised criticality. A neat example, I hope you'll think, agree, of the relationship in this particular case between a deterministic chaos on the one hand and self-organised criticality on the other. A quick look at fractals. This is the famous Mandelbrot set. The Mandelbrot set is actually the black area where there's no solution. And all of these other uh, pretty little uh, patterns are on the edge of the Mandelbrot set, uh, or the edge of chaos, if you like. Uh, and this is ultimate complexity from perhaps the simplest equation, z squared plus c equals z. This is something you can do on your computer at home. It's very simple to generate or you can download programs and play to your heart's content. It is extremely complex and very pretty. Is it any use? Hmm. Examining, say, the curved line forming a circle, the closer you get to the line, the more it becomes a straight line. Fractals are those lines which do not become straighter the closer you get. And that's a quote from Benoit Mandelbrot himself. Waves, natural surfaces, coastlines, uh, all can be fractal. And you can see in the di diagram a fractal coastline. You can also see the red lines on it showing where somebody has tried to measure the distance around the coast by using a fixed length of ruler. Had they used a smaller length of ruler, they would have been able to go into the inlets more and they would have found that the distance around the coast was greater. If, on the other hand, they used a much greater ruler length, the distance around the coast would have been shorter. They would have been overlooking many of the inlets. So you can plot the log of the ruler length versus the log of the equivalent coastline, and that gives you a fractal number which measures the coastline bumpiness. That's an interesting idea. You can measure the bumpiness of a curve. This is a fractal surface now in two dimensions, um, and this is uh, produced by uh, from the Bryce three-dimensional program. There's another one, and another one, and another, and another. The interesting thing about fractal surfaces is that they appear so natural. At bottom left, for example, you'd be hard pushed to say that that isn't a real terrain, but in fact, it's a purely mathematical artifice. And here's some uh, figures from the real world. Uh, top left there is a graph of um, uh, crime clear-up rates between 1970 and 1994 in a county. And you can see that there's uh, uh, quite a wide variation in crime. If we treat the crime curve, the purple line, as though it were a coastline, we can use rulers of different length to measure the difference around the coastline. And if we do that, uh, we get a result uh, in the lower left log log curve, which shows that the crime statistics are in fact fractal with a 98% correlation. So what I hear you cry? Well, the, um, that means there is a self-similarity, so the crime patterns in the division areas will be small-scale versions of the overall county pattern. And on checking, that turned out to be true.
So where does this all take us? Well, here's a, a model, um, a conceptual model of a notional system. You can see that there is a um, space through the middle for energy, substance and information to flow from one end in and out the other, with some of it being hived off into systems A, B, C, D, E and F, which are themselves connected. There is an external surface around this um, object, whatever it is, uh, which is shown to be fractal. And this diagram could represent a cell, could represent a person. It could represent a factory with uh, goods in at the left and goods out at the right, uh, or an economy. Um, and we can see sites marked on there for uh, potential chaotic or fractal behaviour. For example, the self-organised criticality, the inflow and the outflow. Uh, there's deterministic chaos in the environment, potentially. There's fractal flow going through the middle. <coughs> I've marked peristalsis there, or fractal flow. Um, and there could be chaos in the subsystem, which may or may not be evident at this higher level. And then there could be overcoupling between the various systems resulting in um, chaos uh, in internally. So what do we conclude from all this? Well, chaos is neither good nor bad. Chaos just is. Deterministic chaos is potentially all around us. And self-organised criticality is widely in evidence. Self-organised criticality is evident in open systems as energy, <coughs> information and substance throughput increases and it's endemic it seems to complex systems. So when it comes to system design test and integration if we take the systems approach we should um, come across environment and interactions and we should observe increasing interactions between the parts leads to self-organized criticality in the style of back and chen sandpile effect. And closer coupling between the systems and subsystems is likely to lead to deterministic chaos after Poincaré and Lorenz. Now, fractals occur widely in nature and self-similarity occurs at many levels. So as a design technique we may conceive subsystems and sub-subsystems as being self-similar. We can use this idea to restore lost detail in complex images. But the question comes about why is the form y equals ax to the power b so common? It appears in weak chaos, fractals, self-organised criticalities, and it appears to underlie the structure of complexity and self-complex system. Is it to do with a combination of two or more independent uh, and random distributions? As for back and chen sandpile, for example, where there was a random and a Poisson distribution uh, operating independently but at the same time. Chaos, of course, leads to non-linearity, leads to complexity, leads to emergence. So what does chaos have to do with systems thinking, systems design, systems engineering, etc.? They address complex <coughs> socio-technical systems. And complex seems to have mean on the edge of chaos, or at least betwixt order and chaos. Therefore, we should expect chaotic behaviour from complex systems. We can test the design response to chaotic inputs. We can anticipate chaotic, chaotic intra and interactions between subsystems and systems. And we should be aware of the far edge of chaos. We can anticipate fractal behaviour. There are fractals for analysis, resource deployment, multi-layer design, search strategies, restoring detail, managing complexity. Should we induce self-organised criticality? Perhaps we should. It may, in the right circumstance, improve system responsiveness. It may optimise resource utilisation. Altogether, it's a whole new world once you grasp the metal. Thank you for listening.